Hello again. Welcome to the IFAM seminar series on behalf of the Center for Dissemination and Implementation Science and the new Division of Implementation Science within Medical Social Sciences. We are thrilled to be presenting a special topic today. We are hosting two guest speakers for an Implementation Research Institute Fellows Showcase. Um, for those of you who have never heard of the Implementation Research Institute, or IRI for short, it is really one of the nationally leading training institutes for rising stars in the field of implementation science, specifically to invest in early career researchers as they are preparing to write their first large independent grant. And Northwestern was very fortunate that not one, but two IRI fellows this year selected Northwestern as their the host place for their site visit. They could select anywhere in the country. And we had two complete superstars uh, select Northwestern. So we are thrilled to give them both the opportunity to share some of their research with us. We are first going to hear from Dr. Elizabeth McGuire, and then we will hear from Dr. Nikita Lovelady. Each will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we will save all questions for the end. Uh, we will not be monitoring the chat today for those that are here via Zoom. So if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A feature, and we will monitor those at the end. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Liz McGuire, and then uh, Dr. Renad Betis will have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Nikita Lovelady um, when Liz's talk is concluded. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome her up, um, but we have Dr. Elizabeth McGuire here to speak with us first. Um, Dr. Elizabeth McGuire is a child clinical psychologist. She earned her PhD in clinical psychology from Penn State University before doing her year clinical internship at the University of Oklahoma. And she then went to the University of Pittsburgh for her postdoctoral fellowship and joined the faculty there where she's been on the faculty for the last few years. Um, she has a program of research designed to improve the quality of care for underserved children, especially those who have been maltreated and those living in rural communities. And she does this with a really cool, innovative focus on improving the quality of teams. Uh, so we're gonna hear about her work today and I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, Northwestern is just such a great place for implementation science. I'm really excited to learn with, from all of you and share some of my work. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about implementation science and the science of teams. The agenda for today, I'll give you just a little bit of background on my research goals um, very broadly. Then we'll talk about the science of teams, why it's relevant to implementation. I'll give you an example of how I've used this in my own work with my K-23 study. And then depending on how fast I talk, I might give you some recommendations for implementation science of teams. If I don't get to them, you can ask me another time. Okay, so very broadly, my research aims to improve access and quality of mental health services for children. And we can do this in two ways. So we can expand mental health care to other settings where children are present, like schools, primary care, child welfare, and we can improve the quality of care in all of these settings by increasing and improving our implementation of evidence-based practices. The populations that I care the most about are children who experience maltreatment, children and families in rural areas, and service providers across systems, particularly child welfare and mental health. I don't have any conflicts of interest, but the research I'm going to discuss today has been supported by a few different research and training grants from NIH, including my K award. I've also gotten some funding from pilots grants at the University of Pittsburgh. I want to thank my community advisory committee, which is a group of frontline professionals and leadership in child advocacy centers um, who have been giving me really fantastic feedback, feedback and input into my research over the last several years. I also have a great team of mentors, including my primary mentors, David Kolko and Gregory Ahrens, great research staff, and of course, the organizations and participants that have made all of this possible. All right, so jumping into the science of teams. We all know that implementation science is about bridging the gap between research and practice. We want this beautiful, strong bridge with knowledge flowing at high speeds in both directions, but what we have is not quite that. Um, we've got lots of theories, models, and frameworks to help us understand what's going on. And what they all have in common is that they talk about the importance of context, right? That implementation is this dynamic process that unfolds over time across different levels. And typically when we think about the, these levels, we think about clients or patients who are nested within providers who work for organizations that are part of larger systems. But in a lot of settings, Particularly in healthcare, services are not just delivered by individual providers, but by teams of people working together. 
Um, and so in this setting, when you have a team of people who are working together to deliver care and you want to change something about that care, you need that whole team to make changes in what they're doing. Um, so finding this kind of gap, right? We haven't really talked a lot about teams and this team level in implementation science. Um, it's not something that's explicitly in a lot of our theories and models and frameworks. This led me into the science of teams. So what do I mean by team? A team is a group of people who are interacting dynamically, interdependently, and adaptively towards a shared goal. So interdependence means that they have to rely on one another to get their work done. The work of a team can't be done by people acting on their own. I'm gonna use teamwork as a really broad umbrella term for lots of different things about teams. So how they're set up, um, what teams and their members think, feel, and do, and how effective they are. And we can kind of think about these in three big buckets of team inputs, mediators, and outcomes. So when we think about team inputs, we have the structure of the team. So how interdependent are team members? What type of work is the team doing? And we also have things about the composition of the team, like the size of the team, diversity in team member characteristics, turnover or change in team members. When we get to team functioning, this is about the processes and states. So what teams and their members are thinking, feeling, and doing. And these are just a few examples of some of them. When we think about behavioral processes, these are things like communication and coordination. We have affective states that arise out of team members' interactions like cohesion, trust, psychological safety. And then cognitive states, which include things like shared mental models. Do team members have a shared idea about what the work is and how to do it? And then we have team effectiveness. So we think about our output. And this is multidimensional. So we have team performance, like the, the work of the team, right? What's the quality? How efficient are they? How productive are they? This is really context specific and it can be measured objectively, thinking about like, you know, the number of widgets, right? How many widgets is this team producing? Or subjectively, how well do they feel like they're meeting their goals? But it's more than just the performance of their team performance. It's also about the viability of the team. Is this a group of people who want to keep working together, right? If you're doing high quality work, but you don't want to keep working together, that's not a great outcome for a team. And we can also think about member outcomes. So how much are team members learning and developing by being part of this team? We know from decades of research in lots of different settings that better teamwork is associated with more profits, more innovation, and fewer errors. In healthcare settings specifically, teamwork is associated with better service quality, better patient safety, and better clinical outcomes. So this led me to two really broad questions. First, how does teamwork affect implementation of new practices? And then second, can improving teamwork improve implementation? When we think about teams in implementation science, we have lots of different types of teams that might be relevant. Um, so we have implementation support teams. These are teams that are created to implement something, right? Like that's the, their shared goal is to put something new into practice. They might be within an organization or across um, organizations. Typically, membership's voluntary, but not always. And often those teams are time limited, right? They're set up for this purpose, and when that purpose is over, they're disbanded. We also have existing care teams. So here you might think about a surgical team. This team exists. They're providing care to patients. If you want to change something about how this team is providing care, you need everybody on that team to participate and make changes. We also have new care teams. So a lot of our effective practices are actually moving from a model where individual providers are taking care of people to working together as a team. So if you think about something like um, the medical home model or collaborative care, those are creating teams where they didn't exist before as part of the intervention. Also quality improvement teams. So this is a little broader than implementation support teams. They might be existing teams or created for specific projects. They're typically within organizations. And then when you wanna get really complicated, we have multi-team systems, which are when you have different types of teams that each have their own goal, but are also working together in a larger network to meet a broader goal. And then this is uh, from a paper I wrote recently about trying to integrate teams into implementation science. Um, so here we have the team inputs, the team processes and states and team outcomes integrated into an implementation research logic model. So here you can see in that second box, we have different types of team focused implementation strategies. 
And the idea being that these would then operate to improve team processes and states, improve team effectiveness, and that would translate into better implementation outcomes. And I did not do that figure justice. So I'm just gonna suggest you actually read this paper instead. Um, we try to, we give a little bit more context about all these different types of team things that might be relevant as long as some case examples that we use the EPIS framework for. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have different types of team focused strategies. So in that paper, we talked about three different categories. Um, one are strategies that create teams. So you might recognize some of these Eric strategies, create new clinical teams, organize implementation team meetings. These are existing implementation strategies that are creating teams of some kind. We also have implementation strategies that can be modified to target teams. So audit and feedback or disincentives. These are probably typically targeting individual providers, but they could also easily target the team level. And then the third category I think are the most exciting. Um, these are novel strategies that we have not used where we're taking um, effective team interventions and using them to improve teams. So there are, like I said, there's decades and decades of research on teams, a lot of really good established interventions for improving teamwork, and we could use those to improve our implementation efforts. All right, so bringing this together into some of the research that I've done recently. Um, my K award was funded by NIMH in 2021, so I'm just finishing up the third year. It's called Improving Access to Mental Health Services for Rural Youth, Leveraging Multidisciplinary Teams to Enhance Implementation of a Screening and Referral Protocol in Rural Child Advocacy Centers. So there's three aims. The first is to look at associations between different dimensions of teamwork and implementation outcomes in a statewide implementation effort. The second is to develop some uh, novel team-focused implementation strategies and then to do a pilot trial. So the setting for this research are child advocacy centers, and these are designed to be a one-stop shop for children and families after allegations of severe maltreatment, typically sexual abuse. And the idea is that in each of these centers, there's a multidisciplinary team that's responsible for providing a coordinated investigation and connecting families to appropriate services. This model started in the 80s and has spread really rapidly. So there are over 900 CACs in the US. Um, they've been, this model has been shown to improve criminal justice outcomes, use of medical and mental health care, and caregiver satisfaction. There are national standards that require the use of a multidisciplinary team that needs to involve law enforcement, child protection, prosecution, medical, mental health, victim advocacy, and CAC staff, and could also involve other disciplines like probation or schools. So this is a really interesting setting to study teamwork because these teams have members from different disciplines, different organizations, and different systems. Membership and boundaries are fluid and dynamic, and the teams are non-hierarchical because members are answering to their own supervisors and their own agencies. So this is just an example of what this team might look like in a small rural CAC. So in the middle, we have one staff member who's employed by the CAC. And then in the light blue, we have team members employed by different agencies with each of the agencies represented by a gray box. And this might include different law enforcement, law enforcement jurisdictions or multiple mental health agencies. So for AIM-1, um, we had 24 CACs in a single state that were invited to implement a standardized mental health screening and referral protocol. 19 of them actually adopted it. And then the paper here on the bottom is um, one we wrote just describing the general implementation process and identifying barriers and facilitators. The thing that was being implemented here was a standardized protocol for screening for PTSD symptoms and suicidality at the time of a family's visit to the center. And then also using electronic decision support for frontline providers. So this is typically done by a victim advocate or someone without specialized training in mental health. Um, so they had additional support in kind of using that information to make decisions about what to do next. So our question was really, how are specific dimensions of teamwork associated with implementation outcomes? This is published, so I'm not going to go too much into the details, but I'll give you a, kind of the big picture. We did a web-based survey of the team members in the state, and we also used some administrative data. We looked at those inputs, mediators, and, and outcomes. So we looked at how interdependent the team was, different affective, behavioral, and cognitive processes and states, and then their overall sense of how um, well they were performing. 
our implementation outcomes, we looked at what team members thought about the intervention. So if they thought it was acceptable, appropriate and feasible. And then at the center level, we looked at implementation climate and then reach. So of the children who were eligible to get this screening, how many of them actually got screened? So this is what REACH looked like by quarter over time. So each one of these lines is an individual center and the color of that line represents their average screening rate across the entire implementation period. So you can see there's a lot of variability um, both across centers and within centers. So even centers that were doing well sometimes had like lots of ups and downs. And then straight to the results. Um, so we found that affective team functioning. So how much liking, trust and respect there was in the team and overall perceptions of performance related to more positive perceptions of the intervention. And then we also found that teams with stronger team performance had better implementation climate. The one I think is the most interesting is that task interdependence was associated with more positive implementation climate and higher screening rates. So this suggests that teams where members have to rely on one another more to coordinate their workflows and share resources might be better able to make the changes that are needed to use this consistently. We also did some qualitative interviews, still analyzing those, but just want to add that in. Um, our second aim was to develop some team-focused implementation strategies. So we did this through a systematic collaborative um, implementation mapping process with our community advisory committee. We incorporated our AIM-1 findings, and we also drew from the literature on effective team interventions. Here are just some examples of what some of those strategies might look like. So along with their mechanisms. So if we do some cross-training, which is training other people on the team in what this is, we might see better coordination, uh, more supportive or backup behavior, right? So instead of just having one person who's trained, if other people are trained, they might be able to step in and help out if that person's not available. Also things like goal setting uh, might create a better climate for implementing this if everybody's on the same page about why this is important and what their goals are. Um, and then our AIM-3, so we're just starting this now, we're recruiting sites for a randomized um, hybrid type two trial. So we're planning to compare the focused implementation to training and technical assistance based on the rep model. And we did publish a protocol paper here if you're interested in the details of that. So our summary, we know that um, there's not been a ton of attention to teams in the implementation science literature. But we do know that teams and teams work seem to matter for implementation. We definitely know that better teams provide better quality care. So if we use team focused strategies, I think this can help us build teams capacity to implement new um, practices and help further improve the quality of care in these settings. Do I? I oh, I have enough time for recommendations. Yay. <laughs> um, so these recommendations are based on a systematic review that we recently completed. Um, so if, I don't recommend systematic reviews, so much work, <laughs> um, but we had over 10,000 results and it was 58 articles that were looking at how teamwork influences implementation processes and outcomes in healthcare and human service settings. And you can see that a lot of this research is more recent, right? This is, so this is probably typical for most implementation science generally expanding over time, um, but a lot more recent research. I'm not going to tell you the results, but I will tell you what we learned and recommend. Um, so the first thing is I think we really have a lot of room for improvement in how we think about teams. So this is partly a gap in our theories and models and framework and not being explicit about the team level. And then there's a lot of research on teams, like over a century of really well-established um, theories of team effectiveness. And we should be using those to develop more specific hypotheses about what aspects of teamwork matter and why they matter. When we describe teams, um, we really need to be clear about if the group is a team. So not every group of people is a team. And that was one of the first things we found is that a lot of the papers you know, talked about teams, but it was really unclear if these people depended on each other in any way, if they had a shared goal, or if it was just a group of people who happened to like work for the same place. Um, so if it is a team, right, what's the structure of that team? What's the purpose of that team? How do they rely on one another? And then both for sampling and response rates, we need to think about at the team level and then within the team, right? So if you have, how many teams are in your population? How many actually participated? Um, that sort of thing. 
And then when we assessed our teams and team constructs, we found a lot of papers that just said teamwork, right? <laughs> or used some kind of homegrown measure to assess really broad things about teamwork. There's a lot of research on this already. So there's a lot of really good measures. And I think we can do a lot to increase the specificity and the rigor with which we're measuring different aspects of teamwork. And then I think we actually are better at this than average for, implement, you know, as implementation scientists, but really thinking about the organizational and the system context that these teams exist in. Analyzing team level data, it's common to aggregate up to the team level, but before we do that, we need to make sure it actually is a team level variable, right? So looking at within team agreement first. And then analyzing at the team level if we want to draw a team level inferences. So it's not quite the same thing to ask individual people what they think about their team as it is to look at a team level construct. Um, and then this last one is hard because we often don't have enough teams or enough organizations, but just thinking about that clustering of teams within organizations. And then when we get to interpreting our team data, this really goes back to how we conceptualize teams situating our findings within not just implementation science, but also the broader literature on teams, and then using our findings to refine our implementation theories, models, and frameworks. And that's all I have. Um, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. We're gonna do questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, thank you so much. It is such a joy to have the opportunity to learn from these incredible folks. Um, and I'm looking forward to the questions at the end. I have lots. Um, but now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nikita Lovelady, who is an assistant professor at University of Arkansas um, in the College of Public Health. She's the founding director of Arkansas's first hospital-based violence intervention program, UAMS Project HEAL, and she's a native of the Arkansas Delta. Um, as you already heard, she's a 2023 Implementation Research Institute Fellow. Um, she's a 2023 Graduate Fellow of the NIH Randomized Behavioral Clinical Trials Summer Institute and a current KL2 Scholar. Um, she wholeheartedly believes that community is the essence of public health and key to reducing complex health disparities and achieving health equity. And it has been such a pleasure getting to know you, and I'm so excited to learn from you and your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? No? Good? We're good to go? Yay! I'm excited to share with you my work that I've started in the state of Arkansas. I'm gonna talk about how I use implementation science to build and develop our hospital-based violence intervention program in Arkansas. I don't have to say this here, but in 2017, when I first started the journey, I had to tell people that this was a public health issue, <laughs> but we get it now. Um, gun homicide rates are you know, rising, especially since COVID. Um, and even for a non-fatal gun assault, there's a two to one ratio of survivors compared to those who die. Now, I will say it used to be a four to one ratio. So gun homicide is rising. <laughs> um, but with our survivors, they're not only left to deal with the physical injury and those effects, but there's mental injury that comes with that. And so we also know that there are health disparities. This is not a new thing. Um, particularly with young African-American black males ages 15 to 34. Um, gun homicide has been a leading cause of death for this group for almost two decades now. And so that is not the case for any other racial, ethnic, gender group. Um, we do have a new stat now that everyone is aware of. Um, firearm related injuries is the leading cause of death for all children and youth in America. So, um, but when we think about, you know, states like Arkansas, Southern rural states, we're not exempt from this. So we have those disparities with our African-American men there, there as well. Um, it's concentrated to certain areas of the state, just like in most places, including Chicago. Um, we know from the literature that is very old about <laughs> some of the risk factors that play a role in this, particularly for younger African-American males. Um, my dissertation research, um, really began to explore what this intervention looked like. And so from that, we found that we talked to survivors of gun assault and we found that, you know, we need to intervene on these social determinants um, and that we need to target youth and that of course survivors need better access and support for mental health. 
Um, so looking at all of those findings and being a very curious researcher at the time, like I'm still curious, but <laughs> um, I got into hospital-based violence intervention programs and linked up with folks at Drexel um, in Philadelphia with the Healing Heart People program. And I was fascinated. I said, oh, this already exists. Great. So it's an immediate intervention. It's on a teachable moment, moment that golden hour that Ted Corbin always talks about in all his videos. Um, it's a moment where patients have had this near-death experience. They survive. Um, they're recalling and thinking about the events that led to this, but they're also contemplating change. And so it's an important place to begin intervention. If we can provide the proper supports to those who have been um, traumatized and in that space where they're contemplating change, then that's our best book at um, beginning our intervention. And so, and really improving recovery and those health outcomes associated with it. Um, these are linkage interventions. So we start at the bedside in the hospital, it ends in the community. So we're linking them to all those mental, behavioral and social services that they need. Um, and the key piece of this, and I always harp on this, is the peer support. So we have young African-American males, well, some of them are a little older now, um, who have that lived experience of being shot. They have taken their journeys to heal and they're in a place where they can help others in recovery. I always give the model because I want everybody to see how busy the intervention is. <laughs> so if you look at Project Heal, you see we have that comprehensive needs assessment that we do at the bedside. That's our peers really getting an in-depth understanding of their needs post-discharge, whether it's housing, employment, legal assistance, you know, any healthcare needs, follow-up um, materials and supplies that they may need, we do that. Um, we also... Um, provide intensive case management. And so that's us making sure it's not, here's a list for all the things that you need. <laughs> um, go ahead, go forth and be great. <laughs> um, it's no, here, we're going to connect you to this person, our partner who provides this service. And here's what to expect, given that warm handoff, you know, here are the things that you're going to need. Are you able to get those things? Okay, well, I'll help you navigate that. So it's a navigation of not only their follow-up care, health care, but also the social services. And so that's a whole different system too. And we sometimes forget about you need navigation for that as well. Um, we provide them to therapy. And so that's the plus being small. Um, and in Arkansas, we only have one level one trauma center in the state is that we have everything there in one space and we can get them connected and have an appointment pretty quickly with our therapist. Um, we also do group sessions. And so we use a curriculum that was from the Healing Heart People program, the SELF curriculum, which is a psychoeducational trauma CBT um, curriculum that was designed by Sandra Bloom. Um, and it's 50 sessions, but we get through it. And our participants, that's probably what they say based on our feedback thus far, that's their favorite part of the program. <laughs> so, and then uh, and last but not least, of course, that peer support. We're providing peer support from nine to 12 months. So that's, it, our participants are talking to peers and getting support every other day of the week. And so that's a big task, but that's the program. So the problem is, <laughs> We don't have enough research on how effective this is, particularly for our health outcomes. So, you know, TED and some of the programs um, in Chicago, Baltimore, they've been around for more than a decade and they've done some work, you know. It's a huge intervention that happens in a hospital setting. So it's likely that a lot of the robust research has just not been done. Um, but. It, we have some research that has shown that it does reduce crime, re-injury, readmissions, um, increases service use, utilization, and um, cost savings, and particularly medical cost savings. And so we know that, but we don't know enough about those mental and behavioral outcomes and really what impacts it has on that. We actually don't know enough about if it actually um, reduces mortality, you know? So um, there's a lot to find out here, which is where you know, we have this sweet spot with implementation science and integrating this into um, our HVIP research. We have limited evidence for the intervention effectiveness. We probably practically no, little to no evidence for implementation strategies and outcomes. Um, but 
you're in a place where the demand is high. Everybody, at hospitals across the nation are trying to figure out how do we save lives? How do we stop that cycle of violence that happens that um, where our patients are returning to our hospitals, you know, with the same injuries? How do we do that? Um, and so you had a vast uptake and we're like, okay, we're not waiting. The science isn't there. We believe this work, we're gonna do it. <laughs> and so in the South, you saw that emerge from 2020. Before 2020, you had maybe one program in Memphis, Tennessee, that was really a pharmacy-based program. Um, but now they're popping up all across the South. Texas has a couple, um, South Carolina has one, Alabama, Atlanta, we're all getting them, right? So um, everybody has been the bullet in that. So that is why we need hybrid effectiveness implementation approaches in our field, um, because we're in a place where the issue is, is, is that the issue is so important and we have to answer the call, we have to respond to it. But we also need to be very mindful about how we do that. You know, We need to be developing the evidence base for this at the same time. And so this is a sweet spot and this is why I recruited myself to be a mentee of Dr. Jeff Kern <laughs> because of that. <laughs> um, I wanna give you some Southern context too here. Um, just to kind of paint how we are alike and different. <laughs> um, in Arkansas, it's a mostly rural state. Mississippi, the same way, you know. Um, we have one metropolitan city, which is Little Rock. I'm smack in the middle of the state. Everywhere else is rural, okay? Um, and what that means, our social circumstances and our rural communities look different. Poverty, there's limited commerce, business, economic opportunities, so employment is an issue. Um, Limited social services. So we're talking about HVIPs and connecting people to services that are not there, you know? So food deserts, you know, and that's even in Little Rock. If you go south of 630, which is the interstate that was built to segregate the city, um, they can't, they don't have a grocery store. They have to get on a bus and get bus to West Little Rock, Central Little Rock to get to a grocery store. Um, they cannot walk to a grocery store. Um, and we even have places, I think about where my parents are from in Arkansas, I'm from the Delta, very rural communities. I have a father-in-law who lives off the grid and it's not by choice because there is no internet service there. <laughs> so there is, no, there is no way to get on the World Wide Web in the information age in some rural communities in Arkansas. Um, we have, they have limited access to healthcare. So specialty care is a thing. All of that is in Little Rock. So everyone has to travel. And um, that of course looks different too, because there is no public transportation system. We have a bus system in Little Rock and that is it. Rural communities have to drive. And so we all drive. <laughs> um, and then I think with our hospital-based violence intervention research, it's important for us to think about um, the synergy that has, you know, the synergy for this work to com be combined with community violence interventions outside of the hospital setting. And unfortunately in states in the South, since we're all kind of emerging, there's really not a lot of gun violence um, intervention work in, um, to, you know, to connect with, to collaborate with. And that's very different from places like Chicago. Um, and so we have to kind of develop, we're new and developing that synergy as well. Um, and our policies, of course, promote gun use. Arkansas is open carry. We're now stand your ground. Um, we, um, we know that our red states who have these lax gun policies have a 40% higher rate of gun mortality. So that's the, it's a very political landscape that happens um, in these Southern states. So um, despite all of this, I was the one that said, yeah, but we can do this. <laughs> and for all these reasons, and I won't go into detail about this, but I had to present to our chancellors and make sure the legislators were okay with this. <laughs> and we had to provide reasoning for that. Um, but we were funded by the Arkansas Center for Health Disparities, which is an NIMHD funded center grant to do a pilot as a postdoc. And so really looking at, you know, how do we begin to implement this thing? What are factors that are influencing uptake? You know, what are those barriers facilitators? What strategies um, should we be using and what's the plan for the next step? So that's what my pilot study aimed to do. And it really, it has become the meat of all the future current research that we have now. Um, so I conducted interviews with three groups, 
patients, providers, and their social service organizations using the CFER framework. Um, we, I can, our team conducted framework analysis, and that is a rapid approach. It's not as rapid, but it's a rapid approach. It's for those who want to really look at, you know, you have research that has more pragmatic goals. I want a list of factors, you know. I don't want to know how they all overlap and the relationship between all these things, okay? <laughs> um, and so we took that approach. It's not, it's still rigorous. It's still not as fast as you would like. <laughs> Um, and then the second phase of this was to do some evidence-based quality improvement. And so um, Terrence Swindle in Arkansas is big on this and really was a key piece, um, key person to helping us really develop this. But um, it's a consensus making process with all of our stakeholders across um, sectors. Um, we brought our medical providers together in the same room with our patients, with our social service organizations. And we really took that time to look at that interview data, those findings, and we prioritized those barriers, those facilitators, um, rated it based on importance. We mapped strategies onto those factors and um, we came up with, and then helped inform our implementation plan. Um, time's sake, I'm not gonna go through too much of this, <laughs> but this is our sample. <laughs> we, we pride ourselves on being able to get a diverse sample I pride myself on being able to get a surgeon to sit and talk with me. <laughs> so, um, but we have a very representative sample of all the people that would be involved in this intervention. So some of our results from our patients, overall high willingness to participate. So acceptance was good. They thought it would work, it would be helpful. Um, every and all groups really talked about the importance of this peer specialist. Um, so our patients gave us an idea of some of the needs that needed to be prioritized when we begin to intervene. The barriers, patient readiness, you know, if they're not in a space, given the trauma that they've experienced, that fluctuates. So that's, this is where we learned that I'll enroll in the hospital. I may talk to you, you know, after I'm discharged, but I may not talk to you for a couple months, even though you're calling and trying to talk to me, because I'm not in a place where I'm ready. And when I'm ready, it happens. So we, we see that all the time with our current um, implementation. So um, mistrust, that's with everything, systems, people, <laughs> people in systems. Um, and so, and of course that was heavy for us to really think about that because we, our institution somehow has this perception and community where we are connected to government. And so, um, and it's because we're a state, we're teaching hospitals, so we have, get state funds. And so there's always concern about us being connected to government. And there's another layer of, of mistrust with our patients. Um, stigma, help seeking stigma, mental health stigma. Um, and then of course, some of the facilitators that came from our patients. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the results because there's a lot. Um, um, with our medical providers, of course, same thing, high acceptance, it could work. But the barriers that they identified is that, hey, this is a complex issue. And how are we supposed to do anything about this, right? This is a population that I have trouble engaging <laughs> in the hospital, right? So how do, how do we begin doing that? You know, they were really honest with us and I appreciate them. They were like, I am not comfortable approaching black males who've been shot in my hospital about violence prevention. So um, I'm gonna need help with that. So, um, Appreciated them for that because that's how we came up with a lot of trainings <laughs> to give them. Um, and then, you know, there was concern about like having the hospital connected to all these community organizations and resources and how to really manage all of that. Um, and of course, facilitators for them is like, okay, we need people that are going to be dedicated to do this. We, you know, we can't just do it all. Our nurses, our clinicians cannot um, take on the load of adding another program here. And of course, they highlighted training um, as a, a definitely uh, a strategy a need that they um, wanted. And so with our social service orgs, same thing, it could work. I think the unique thing to point out here is that they had insight on how, on what would be needed for this peer specialist role, the community health worker role. And that's because a lot of these organizations actually hire, <laughs> they manage <laughs> community health workers. And so they gave us insight on, hey, you're gonna need training, you need to give them proper supervision, you need to make sure they got full benefits, like all of those things matter. And it really helps when we think about equity and, and the things that are needed for um, um, the community health worker role. 
Um, and so I really appreciate them bringing that out. No barriers, of course, this is their, this is their space. They're like, we help people do this every day. <laughs> so we're ready. When you're ready, we're ready. And so that's what we got from our, um, our, our um, social service organizations. And they're the ones who also highlighted this warm handoff. Now, don't send anybody to my building without you know, telling them everything about who we are, who they what they should expect. You tell us everything about them too. <laughs> so, um, and I'll skip that for time's sake, but I wanted to kind of talk about these barriers that were prioritized. So of course, having a right peer specialist, concerns about funding and sustainability of this. They didn't want another program that comes and leaves. Um, having commitment from our UAMS leadership, making sure our staff, um, was culturally appropriate because particularly with our patients having some concern about not being treated well in the ED and trauma and that's a lot to associate with criminal stigma that comes with being shot. Um, mistrust, mistrust in the system, not being able to reach patients and we kind of, um, we've We've answered, responded to this by revising our model and not just being in the ED, but in our trauma unit and making sure that we integrate the two. <laughs> um, availability of services. And even when you're working with community partners, and this is something that a lot of people don't talk about either, is that, you know, there are challenges with working with several community organizations, and especially when there's funding involved. Everybody needs the money to do the things that they're doing. <laughs> and you have to be very careful and uh, mindful of of how to do that well. Um, facilitators, the community, are, we already had buy-in. <laughs> they thought that that was something that was there. Um, fortunately, we also had in our ED and trauma unit, we had a peer specialist. So we had this peer community health worker already integrated um, for an addiction research study. And so they saw a model before and they said, oh, this works here. I'm sure this could work here. So we didn't get a lot of pushback when we we're trying to make sure our peers have ex access to EPIC, our medical um, records. And so um, some of the strategies that came from our EBQI sessions, um, and I'll say, this is our team um, putting, they did not say this, these are not their terms. Our team, <laughs> our team used Eric's taxonomy to kind of place what they said in those words, but they were like, no, we need money. <laughs> <laughs> you need money and you need to get that chancellor to buy in on this. And so that's, that's what that was. But I go to say, there's a lot of strategies. You see big intervention and you see big strategies, right? So it's a lot of work that goes into this, but we were fortunate. We were able to launch Project Heal through the city of Little Rock. We have ARPA money um, and received a sub award for that. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of these studies for time's sake, but City of Little Rock, it's a hybrid one effectiveness implementation pilot. Um, we have 38 participants that are enrolled. Um, we are assessing both um, our intervention outcomes, but we're qualitatively assessing our implementation outcomes. And so that's using a proctor framework as well. Um, we, in the fall and September, we were fortunate to get funded for UG3, UH3. Um, grant. And so that helps us build out to eight counties within central Arkansas. So you'll see that middle, Pulaski's right in the middle and all the other counties surrounding it. <laughs> I know it's what I should have made that big. I wanted to give you lights. <laughs> but um, so we're doing that. We're going to do a more robust, robust EBQI with this. We're, able, we're actually going to use concept mapping software. Okay. Um, and within that software, we'll be able to look at cluster maps and identify no go and no-go zones. And so we're excited about being able to do that. And then the phase two, we'll actually implement that using an interrupted time series design. So my KL2 research kind of said, okay, what about these counties in the Delta that have these high rates of gun violence that are not in central Arkansas that we need to focus on. And so that's what my KL2 study does. It really explores some of those barriers that are very specific to those particular counties. And so we're getting, uh, getting ready to actually do some of our EBQI with those participants. Um, future goals, not gonna go too deep into this, but overall, I, we wanna develop and test a statewide HVIP. Um, we wanna be able to do multi-site trials and so that's also collaborating with our sisters, such as Mississippi, who have very similar contacts that we have. Um, we definitely need to, some policy um, in, um, implementation research here um, because 
the money's there. We just have to get our legislators to agree to um, let us reimburse for it. Um, last but not least, I kind of want to leave you with this. For our world of HFIP implementation research, I believe formative research is needed. We have been implementing these programs across the nation now, and we still are, but there's a lack of research on it. And so we need to really get an understanding of what are those factors across different contexts? Um, what are those strategies and start testing them for outcomes? You know, um, There's a lot of variability in HVIPs. So people have HVIPs that don't do what our HVIP does. And so we need to figure out what that looks like and what does adaptation look like? Um, we need more pilots for sure. We definitely need our hybrid effectiveness implementation trials. I assume based on where we are, we're not ready for the hybrid three, far from that. <laughs> but some hybrid ones, hybrid twos definitely need to happen. Um, and most recently, um, through some of my training, I've identified optimization trials as a need for the field. We're a field of gun violence prevention. We're throwing everything at the kitchen sink. Um, and these are huge packages sometimes, but we need to know what works best, you know? Um, is it, you know, just these two components with this package of strategies that give us the best outcomes for PTSD? You know, what, are, what is that? And so we need to really spend some time and really think about how do we design trials like that. Now, I add to this slide every time I present. <laughs> and look, I always forget some more. <laughs> so as I was sitting over there, I was like, oh, I forgot this person on that slide. But I say it as I say, large team, a lot of people involved, you know, very appreciative of all the hard work that it takes to do this. Um, and it definitely could not happen without them. Um, and that's it. Wonderful. I'm going to ask, invite Elizabeth back up and hand her the mic because we have one worn mic and then one past mic. Um, and we can either take questions from the room or I also could see that some were coming through on Zoom. Any questions in the room? Okay. Um, I think to be heard, you need to be in the mic. So hold on. <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name is Amishwa. I'm actually... Um, a physician and have worked a lot in the inpatient and outpatient space. And um, thank you for your work, number one. Um, I think it probably has large implications um, across um, health systems. And the point I'm going to make is uh, health systems all of a sudden are going to be coming online to really start at least documenting social health needs, right? And so when you talk to different um, groups who are doing this type of work locally, there seems to be a very um, interesting dynamic between who is doing the intake and what the location is in regards to uptake of the, you know, of the whatever it is you're asking about the social health need. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you think we can capture that because I think this has huge implications on a volume of data that's going to be coming online um, due to metrics and things um, very soon. So, yeah, I'll ask the audience to clarify who you're asking the question for. That one's for Nikita, I'm assuming. OK, so a question for Nikita um, about how she's clarifying and capturing some of her data. OK, um, so for our. For the initial needs assessment, there's a reason why the peer asks the questions. Um, and they're the ones that really have the initial intake of the participants being a part of this, right? Um, they have the lived experience, they're in the rooms, they give them a story, their story. Um, they're talking about their experience in recovery. They're building that rapport with patients. And at that point, the patients and their families are definitely more open to being honest and telling us what they need. We have evidence of that because in Epic, this is why we give them access to Epic also, we can look at the social worker's notes and see a vast difference in what they tell us compared to what they tell our hospital social workers. Um, and so we know that that relationship, that rapport building is necessary. Um, as far as um, intake with our, you know, referrals for our social service, so social services, we handle that as well. Um, our team, we have a, a our peers do some of the handoff 
our um, social workers for the actual program does some of that. Um, but our clinicians are not necessarily involved in that handoff to of referrals to social services um, that they need. You know, they're working closely with our staff. And that's a, why we were very intentional about integrating our staff into the clinical setting. Our peers go to trauma meetings, just like any other clinical staff, you know, every day at 9 a.m. they're there. You know, they're, they're the ones on the floors interacting with our nurse champions. So they're very much integrated into um, our clinical system. And that was a big piece of this. So I hope that answers your question, Zoom. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? I'll ask a question while you all are thinking about questions. And this is to both of you all. You just presented beautiful examples of applied implementation research. And we have some folks in the room and online who are starting their work in this space. And I'm wondering if there are any lessons learned or wisdom that you'd like to share with folks who are just starting to do this work um, so that they can learn from you. It's hard um, <laughs> just to validate that. Like, it, I think it's nice now looking back, I'm like, wow, like this has really come a long way, but like the early stages are really challenging. Um, I think especially with like building community partnerships and getting to know people, I think a lot of the advice I got was like, just be part of, just be there, just listen, you know, and, like it'll develop. I actually, I found that not to be the case. Like I could get a lot of like one or two conversations with people, but then that they were like, why, why would we keep talking? <laughs> right? Like the, I, I don't, I don't have anything else. So I actually found the most helpful thing for me was getting some really small pilot grants where I could say like, I think, do you want to do this project with me? And maybe it wasn't, you know, the biggest project or exactly what they needed, but they were interested enough. And then through the process of doing that, we were able to like build a relationship because we actually had a reason to meet and things to discuss. And that really then built into other things. Um, so I think that's part of the challenge too. And I would say, you know, I'm five years into the child advocacy center world, I'd say. And I'm just now like, oh, I think I know people. And like, my name is now coming up when I'm not there, which is very cool, but also took years and years to happen. Yeah. I echo that. It takes a lot to build um, partnerships. I think for me, um, so I was trained in health promotion and prevention research, um, a lot of behavioral health community level interventions. Um, and when I got introduced to the world of implementation science, I was so confused. <laughs> it's like, this is program evaluation. I don't know what, <laughs> you know, but as I took courses and like I said, recruited Jeff, <laughs> um, I think the key piece is just to be open to, you know, learning a different way, a different science in this and really figuring out how to apply that. Use everything to apply it to the issue that you're trying to resolve and understand, right? Um, and that's a key piece of what has been there. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, like we were talking about today, you do it every day. You learn every day. It's new every day. Um, just this summer at the implementation, um, eh, not implementationist, but look, they, they presented on that, at the Behavioral Clinical Trials um, Summer Institute, um, that's when it finally clicked. It took us having discussions after Wynne Norton and the rest of them um, um, presented on implementation research. And it clicked for us. We had a discussion and I said, okay, I, am tr I have to differentiate if I am trying to change the behavior of the implementer <laughs> or the patient, you know? <laughs> and so having clear understandings, I'll just say that it takes, it's a journey of learning and really trying to apply the concepts and things that you're getting from there. And just be open. I mean, I see a lot of overlap with the field community engagement. I come from a background of doing community engaged research. And so when we get to partnership building and health equity, a lot of that stuff makes sense for me. Um, and so, but still being open to learn new frameworks and really how to apply those to the area of research that I conduct. And so, um, but yeah, so stay a learner. <laughs> Hi, I want to thank you both for such wonderful presentations. Um, this question is primarily for Dr. McGuire, but I think it applies for both of you as, as kind of people who are training in implementation science now. You've probably been presented with like 143 theories, models, and frameworks, and yet in your own work have identified still need to develop those further. So as people who are kind of coming into the field, 
and seeing the deficiencies, um, do you have thoughts on what to do about that? Do we create, continue to create more or do we do some consolidation process? I'm curious about your thoughts. I don't think we need any more. <laughs> I don't want any more, at least. I feel like I've learned enough. Um, but I do think, you know, the even though teams aren't really explicitly in a lot of our frameworks, it's not there's space for them in there. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily, you know, that we need to totally redo things. It's more just we need to be thoughtful about like advancing the frameworks and the theories that we have. Um, so the like the paper I referenced, like we we just used Epis, right? Epis has plenty of space in there for teams, and teams also aren't like in one specific spot, right? Because you have some teams that are within an organization. So you're in your inner context there. And then you have some that are like very cross system and maybe that's a bridging factor. Um, so that's actually one of the things we tried to do in that paper is also like give examples of different types of teams and where they fit in these different frameworks. Um, and I know like the CFER 2.0 has teaming now in there, which I was super excited about. And then I realized like, oh, but they're only talking about that one type of team. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, they're not, like they're not in there explicitly. And I think that makes it a little bit harder for people to pay attention to them because it's not on like the checklist that somebody's going through. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not space for them in there. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, I have a, a funny, something funny to share. So, you know, in our fields, when we have all these frameworks and implementation science and behavioral health research, you know, it's, um, combining of them, right? So with our UG3 grant, you know, working with scientists in my department who are not implementation scientists, they were like, no, re-aim is it. That's what we're going to use. And I was like, that's okay. We use re-aim. And I was like, you know, the key to it for me is to identify which constructs are relevant, right? And use those. So we compromise. We got re-aim and we have some of those implementation look. So um, we had to really identify what constructs we were focusing on and we combined the two. So use what you need if you can. And if you, if not, you need to create some new, <laughs> some new ones, so. I'll just add too, as far as the teams piece, like the, the team effectiveness and team theories, like I don't, they're not in opposition to our theories and models and frameworks. I think a lot of them can be very nicely integrated um, without developing anything new and just saying we're using this and this. Yeah. yeah. Like there's a, yeah. you know, really very old theory of like team development that you, most of you have probably heard about like the forming, storming, norming, performing, mm -hmm. right? Well, what if you wanted to look at that, you know, how a team's doing across implementation stages, you mm. could use that team that. theory and, you know, the EPIS stages and just look at both of those things. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to just kind of take multiple things and not make anything new, but just apply both of them yeah. in an integrated way. All right, is one o'clock now. Um, I'm being told by our MC that we can take another question, but I think we'll be closing the webinar momentarily. Um, so. If there's enthusiasm in the room for another question, I think we can take one more. Great. Uh, pause. We're gonna give you a mic so that those, uh, we're, there's a mic behind you. <laughs> I just had a, had a question about cost. How much does it cost to get these teams up and running and implementing? Oh, if you're starting out, you got to plan a budget. How much would you build in for these kinds of things? So for the ARCH pre-implementation study, it was a 50K grant. That is not the actual implementation of it. 300K is a scaled down, very minimum start for an HFIP implementation. And so um, we get that through the city on a yearly basis to keep the program going. So that's another key thing is kind of finding funding sources that are sustainable to keep that up. Um, and then for our, with our UG3 budget, of course, we have a lot more money in that. And so um, we're able, uh, I can't give you figures on it, but I want you to say, I want to say that the budget is about for the implementation phase of it, it's a, a million a year. And so of course we have sub awards going to community partners and it's a eight county. So, I mean, it's it's lo much larger, but for one single age fifth, at least 300K to start. And that doesn't, that's bare minimum that gets you a full-time here, 
a part-time social worker, you know, um, a part-time research coordinator. That's what that gets you. Yeah. Yeah. So for the teams that I've been working with, they are existing teams, so there's no new funding. Um, they're generally funded, you know, through whatever position already exists, right? So most of the people on these teams are, have jobs, right? From some agency, law enforcement, child welfare, victim advocacy agency. Um, so there's funding there. And then the work that they're doing as part of the multidisciplinary team is just really part of that job. So there's no additional um, salary or anything going to them. Um, the child advocacy centers themselves are funded by a mix of lots of different things. Um, one of their big sources of funding is often the Victims of Crime Act. So um, some funding from that, they do a mix of fundraising, some bill for things. It's really all over the place. All right, great. I want to thank our speakers. I again want to thank the sponsors, uh, the Medical and Social Science um, Implementation Science Division, the Center for Dissemination and Implementation Science, our two stellar speakers. Um, we will try to get these slides or a version of these slides posted on the IFAM Seminar Series website so that you can contact these fabulous scholars with any questions about their work. They both have a contact us slide at the end of their talk. So thank you again to all who joined us both in person and virtually. We appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you at a future IFAM seminar. Thanks so much.